you can. Sure. Let's roll. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I know a few people are still grabbing some coffee and drinks, help yourself. Um, I'm Jennifer Puentes, and I'm here to introduce our visiting assistant professor, Dr. Katie Allen. Uh, she received her BA in International Relations and Anthropology from uh, State of University of New York at Geneseo, mm -hmm. okay. Um, her master's and PhD, both in anthropology, were completed at the University of Buffalo. Her research focuses on the use of archeological human remains to analyze um, questions regarding migration, identity, political issues um, of the past. Most of her previous research focuses on 16th and 17th century Ottoman period in Southeast Europe. Her work in Hungary, Romania, Croatia, um, the focus of her doctoral dissertation defended in 2017. Should we clap for that a little bit, right? <laughs> I know we've been survived. celebrating everyone's work. Uh, likewise, she consults on a number of other projects in both Romania and Hungary, including a large multi-year project um, on the Hungarian Copper Age starting this summer. Um, in addition to her consulting work and her own research in Southeast Europe, she's currently leading a collaborative project with colleagues in Greenland National Museum and the University of Copenhagen's Department of Forensic Medicine uh, to CT scan, analyze, and publicize three high-profile Greenlandic mummies. Uh, she plans to be in Nook. Uh, this summer to kick off what is hoped to be the start of a very long collaboration meant to bring global attention to Greenland's threatened archaeological record. When teaching, she loves to find unique ways to interact with her students, both online and in the classroom. She loves to highlight how fantastic and relevant four-field anthropology and social sciences really are. When not working, she loves reading, not archaeology. So <laughs> going outside of the discipline. Uh, yoga, spending time outdoors, and exploring Eastern Oregon with her husband and hilarious little monster, Gabriel. Little monster is her words, not mine. It's <laughs> very sweet. Okay, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it is my privilege to have a chance to talk to you guys about my research, uh, both my past research that I've completed uh, and I'm working on trying to get it published, uh, as well as my current research. And if I have a few minutes at the end, maybe talk a little bit about some of the stuff that I, I have planned coming down the pipeline. Uh, so for the next about 30 or 40 minutes, what I'd like to do is introduce those of you who are unfamiliar with the field of bioarchaeology uh, to what it is that specialists in this field do. I'll give you a brief background on the, my research and historical context. Uh, talk about how this research uh, informs this history and how I hope that this work and other works uh, will help to alter the historical narratives of Islam in Europe. Uh, and then have a couple of minutes to talk about what's next. So uh, I'm a bioarchaeologist. That's a combination, essentially, in anthropology of archaeology and biological anthropology. Uh, so it is a mixture of these two subfields brought together to analyze human skeletal remains in a way that highlights both the biological and the cultural reality of the human experience, what it means to be human. Um, and so essentially we do quite a lot of field work, just like archaeologists who just focus mostly on humans, human remains. Most of them are skeletal, but uh, as Jennifer mentioned, sometimes we do work with mummified human remains as well. Uh, the research context where I work predominantly is in Southeast Europe. Uh, so those of you unfamiliar with Eastern European geography, uh, I work predominantly in Romania. Uh, specifically the western part, I've done a number of studies throughout Transylvania, which is a beautiful area if anyone ever has a chance to visit. Uh, but the western side is the side that was part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I work in Hungary, right here, and in Croatia as well. As you can see, uh, just a couple of, of travel photos or photos of the areas where I work. They're beautiful landscapes, they're beautiful countries to work in. Um, perhaps sometimes Eastern Europe doesn't get as much attention or credit as Western Europe, but it's a fantastic uh, place to do research. And I hope someday a place to take students with me, since it's very safe uh, and also a place uh, we're very welcoming to international collaborations and international foreign researchers. So the historical context of my research is the Ottoman period, uh, particularly the Ottoman period in Southeast Europe. So right here, the orange 
on this map uh, represents the Ottoman Empire at its greatest extent. Okay. I specifically am interested, however, in the Ottoman Empire when it moved into what is traditionally defined as European lands. Okay, so everything within this circle is kind of the period that I focus on. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar with the Ottoman history, the Ottoman Empire is a Turkish principality, uh, kind of focused in on Anatolia and then moved outwards. In many ways, the Ottoman Empire replaced the Byzantine Empire. It lasted for over 600 years, a very multi-ethnic, multilingual uh, um, empire that spread into northern Africa, the Caucasus, much of the Arabian Peninsula, and of course, Southeast Europe. Uh, it, was, it is said to be one of, if not the most influential Muslim uh, or Islamic political entity in history. Uh, before the expansion into Europe, most of the European states or the lands that the Ottomans came in uh, were predominantly Christian. So that's going to have kind of a play uh, into some of the stuff I talk about. Uh, the fall of the empire happened long after they retreated out of Europe. So this time period, this a uh, brief glimpse in history when the Ottomans were in Europe was actually only a, about 100 to 200 years. The Ottoman Empire itself was 600 years. So we're talking about a brief period in this, uh, in this empire's reign. Uh, it, they retreated out of the upper parts of the Balkan Peninsula first. So where I work in Romania, Hungary, and Croatia uh, had the shortest uh, Ottoman history, the lower Balkan states having a longer uh, time period in which they were under the Ottoman crown. Uh, very distinct from other European empires, so we hear a lot about the Roman Empire, the Iron Age, Celts, uh, but the Ottoman Empire in Europe is distinct from, from all these other empires in a couple of ways, one of which is the state religion is Islam. Uh, secondly, it is very, very diverse, very multilingual, as I mentioned. Uh, and thirdly, it stands and continues to be a, a bit of a controversial spot in history. So unlike the romanticized Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire is sometimes treated as a period of decline and decay. Right? So they see this time period in their history as not one of pro progress um, or affluence. It's, it's seen as a bit backwards. It's actually a term that can be uh, connected to the Ottoman uh, decades or the Ottoman years. Uh, so why do I study skeletons from the Ottoman period, right? So there are obviously quite a bit of written records. This is a more modern history. Uh, many archaeologists specialize in more prehistoric or older periods. Um, but I actually think that the more modern, the more recent ones are fantastic opportunities for archaeologists and anthropologists. Uh, for anyone who's ever done historical analysis, they know that sometimes the written record can be incomplete, inaccurate, or inaccurately interpreted, right? So smaller places, smaller towns, less geopolitically important places might not be found very frequently or referenced very frequently in written records, okay? Similarly, marginalized people, so people in society, not everybody might have ended up in these historical records. So if we want to get at understanding all parts of a past society, sometimes the written record isn't necessarily enough. Uh, records can be lost. Where I wor the site that I work on in, in Western Romania, uh, when the Austro-Hungarian Empire came in and overthrew the Ottomans, they raised and burned the entire garrison, uh, which means that every written record, every uh, daily account that was he held inside the garrison was lost as well. So, um, and then lastly, some, some areas where archives are kept right now are rather difficult to get at. So uh, when I started planning this research, when I was applying for the grant money to do it, I uh, was at the height of a lot of um, terrorist bombings and issues in Turkey. I think it was actually the summer that the, the military tried to overthrow the government. So all of the archives of this Ottoman period are held in Istanbul, right? Making it a little bit more difficult for me to solely base my interpretations and my uh, energy on just the written word. So uh, anthropology and archaeology has a lot of, of a large role to play even in historical periods where there is quite a lot of written word. Uh, the second reason why I study skeletons from a more modern or more recent written uh, historical time period is because in this part of the world, uh, this history is actually still very relevant to social and political turmoil that exists there today. Um, so in the couple of jarring examples where this history uh, and the ethnic and religious diversity that was introduced during this time period in history um, have severely impacted a lot of people. Uh, so in the 1980s, you see right here, this is a children's book. In the 1980s, the Bulgarian government mandated uh, assimilation processes. So they mandated uh, over a million Bulgarian Muslims to change their names from uh, a Muslim form to a Christian equivalent. 
that was based on an interpretation of the history uh, that said all of you uh, during the Ottoman period were forced to convert uh, from Christianity to Islam, and therefore we think you should convert back. So uh, a little bit uh, even more brutal um, example, the Srebrenica massacre, wars in Yugoslavia, ethnic cleansing, uh, the war in Kosovo, many of these issues that have kind of haunted Southeast Europe uh, and the Balkan Peninsula are uh, rooted in an ethnic and religious conflict that was introduced during this time period, uh, as well as interpretations of the historical record and exactly what happened when the Ottomans came in. Um, and governed these, these uh, areas for a couple hundred years. Uh, and so these are, these are essentially um, examples from the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. Um, but this is still very uh, relevant today, actually. This is a Washington Post headline that came out as I was um, doing this research. Uh, so the rise of populism uh, and the refugee crisis in this part of Europe is actually reawakening some anti-Muslim sentiments. Uh, and the result of it is uh, the use of the Ottoman history in the time period that I study to justify some of the political decisions. So Orban is Hungary's prime minister. Uh, essentially, when the refugees tried to get into Hungary, he invoked the Ottoman time period uh, and the interpretation of the Ottoman time period as one of all brute invasion of outsiders uh, as his justification for putting up a fence and keeping out um, uh, the refugees. So um, my goal was to take the bioarchaeological record, uh, to take skeletons that already had been excavated and they were already being stored in museums around the area but had very little analysis had ever been done on them, uh, and to use it to address a debate that is still um, going back and forth between historians, and that is, uh, the identity of the Ottomans in Europe. Who were the Ottomans uh, during this 150 to 200 years? Uh, two different interpretations. One champions the, that the Ottomans were Europeans. They were converted from Christianity, predominantly to Islam, uh, when the Ottomans took over. And then they moved around the European areas, but biologically um, they were originally uh, kind of local European uh, communities and individuals who became the Ottomans. The other interpretation of this debate champions migration of outsiders, so kind of mass migrations or mass influx of non-Europeans, as we traditionally label them, non-European people and non-European communities coming into Europe from Anatolia and other parts of the Ottoman Empire. So I wanted to use the biological record to see if I could kind of get at this debate and get a little bit more information about these two interpretations of the same story. Uh, so what I did is I collected uh, skeletal research from four Ottoman populations. Okay, so two in Hungary, one in Romania, and one in Croatia. Uh, if you see the numbers right here, these represent the Ottoman communities that are the skeletal collections that I analyzed. Uh, then in order to determine, uh, to basically consider the two interpretations of this historical debate, whether they are more biologically related to Europeans or more biologically related to non-Europeans, I needed some comparative populations. So I also collected data from European, uh, prior to the Ottoman period, so medieval European populations, as well as a, a skeletal collection representing individuals from Anatolia and Syria. Syria excuse me. Uh, that allowed me to essentially consider who these the Ottoman skeletons were closer related to, the Europeans, which is what we'd expect if they're all converted Europeans, uh, or individuals from Anatolia, which we might expect if they are predominantly migrants or immigrants coming in from outside of Europe. I did three methods, I used three methods, a metric analysis, a non-metric analysis, and a strontium isotope analysis. Uh, metric analysis is based on this idea or this, uh, the fact that our bones, especially the human skull or the human crania, uh, the shape and the form of the bone can, is heavily influenced by your genetics. So if we can get at the shape and form, if we can get at a, a better understanding of these specific characteristics of your skull, we can actually ask questions about genetic rela relatedness without doing destructive ADNA analysis. So I collected this metric, uh, these metric data from skulls from every one of these skeletal collections that I just showed you on the map. The second analysis, uh, non-metric trait analysis, is based on this same idea, only these are variations that are not metric, they're not measurable. Um, they're, they're tiny anomalies or tiny variations in your, in your skull that uh, whether they show up, whether you have them 
if you don't have them or how they manifest uh, can be influenced by your genetics. So essentially, if you have some of these small non-metric anomalies, uh, you, mo you more likely share similar anomalies with populations that you're closer related to genetically. So this is another way that uh, anthropologists can study relatedness uh, without doing anything destructive. And the third analysis is strontium isotope analysis. This is a research method that archaeologists and anthropologists frequently use to study migration. Uh, it is based on the, the fact that uh, your dental enamel, when it is forming, it'll take on, it can take on the signature, the strontium signature of the food and water that you consume. So if the food and water you consume is all local, you essentially absorb in your teeth a local signature uh, that matches your environment. What this allows us to do is if you are buried somewhere, you're buried in an environment very different from where you were when your enamel developed, we can see that because the signature in your teeth do not match the signature in the environment around you. Uh, so I was able to do this for one of my collections. Uh, I exported some teeth from the Romanian collection and did it in collaboration with the uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's Strontium Lab. Uh, in order to uh, determine which of my individuals uh, might have not been from that area, who might not have had childhood in that area that allowed them to absorb a strontium signature that was local, I also had to test uh, archaeological fauna to get an idea of what the, the local area looked like. So uh, some of my highlights, some of my result highlights, I'm going to kind of go over these relatively briefly. I would love any questions that you guys have if I do not fully explain any of it. Three things that popped up when I analyzed these three data sets. The first being that the Ottoman populations were distinct from the comparative populations. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, the second is that there was a diverse background between the males and the females within communities, and that wasn't something I expected. So the males and females from in one Ottoman population uh, were different from each other. Uh, and then third, there was quite a bit of within group diversity and between group diversity. So a lot of diversity biologically within one Ottoman uh, settlement and between the four Ottoman settlements spread through Hungary, Romania, and Croatia. So this right here uh, is a visualization, uh, apologies the labels are in dark, uh, this is a visualization of distance matrices. These are essentially a calculation that I, I took um, to compare the distance between the communities. So it gave me an idea of how biologically divergent they might be. So if you see the green circles, those are the, those are the Ottoman populations. And these four uh, blue squares are the comparative populations. So remember, I chose these comparative populations because history is telling us that these are communities or populations that they are most likely coming from if they are either converted Europeans or migrant, migrants coming from outside. Uh, but the first thing that, that became very apparent is that none of the communities fell very close to these comparative populations. They didn't cluster all around the Europeans. They didn't cluster around the Anatolian series. In fact, they're quite far from the comparative populations that history kind of led me to, to use. The metric data, this is, uh, that, that chart was from the, the craniometric data. This is the non-metric data. And essentially, it told me the same thing. The Ottoman populations, circled in green, don't fall particularly close to any of the comparative populations that are squared in blue. Okay? So none of them clearly align biologically with these communities. So then I decided to split them up and take a look at the males and females separately. Uh, and it turned out actually to be a good move because it seems that there is a, a bit of a different history going on for males and for females. Uh, so again, even when I separated them out, I only compared the Ottoman males to the European and Anatolian males. And then I only compared the uh, Ottoman females to the Anatolian and European females. Uh, and what, it, what I had is still not very close. The Ottomans don't particularly align with one of these comparative groups over the other. Um, and, and not only that, but when you look at them, this pattern in the males is not replicated in the females. So they're different from the comparative populations in different ways. Uh, another thing that became apparent when I ran a couple other tests is there was a, a, a large divergence, a statistically significant divergence between males and females within one community. Uh, so right here, these bars, they represent the amount of divergence, biological distance between all the males in one community and all the females in another community. So when you look at the comparative groups, the non-Ottoman groups, they have quite low distance. So the males and females are not that distinct from each other. But the Ottomans, on the other hand, had very high and statistically significant differences. So the males and females were in the same group were very different from each other. So 
in all of these uh, results, it keeps coming back to me that none of them are falling. None of, I'm not getting an answer to the question, are they converted Europeans or are they immigrants coming from non-European areas? Uh, and so I decided to take the analysis down to the individual level. And I ran what's called a discriminant function analysis uh, to try to look at the biological relationships of individuals in all of these communities. Uh, and so I did it with all four of my populations. Uh, and essentially what this test gave me is the probability that every single individual was either very closely aligned with European populations or very closely aligned with Anatolian populations. And I only categorized them as European or Anatolian if they had a very high probability, that meaning their skeletal shape and form that's all uh, informed by their genetics was very similar to all of the um, biological characteristics seen in one or the other population. Uh, and what happened is actually most of the individuals highly aligned with one or the other. So the green and blue are the uh, comparative populations, either European or Anatolian, and the gray represents other. Okay? So these are individuals who did not highly align with one, um, with one side versus the other side. Uh, so there's two possible interpretations that I'm playing around with, with for what the other stand for. I actually expected more people to be other. Um, because if my comparative populations are, are not the right populations to compare them to, uh, they wouldn't align highly with them. So in other words, the Ottoman Empire was in northern Africa. They were in the Caucasus. It was further down in the Arabian Peninsula. So if these individuals were closely related to some of those populations, they wouldn't align highly with Europeans or an Anatolian Syrian population. Uh, so they would align as other. And so I was surprised that more of them didn't come up as other. Uh, a second interpretation that is possible uh, is that these might be individuals who represent some sort of an admixed biological background. So you have multiple generations living in these Ottoman garrisons. You've got com obviously converted uh, individuals who converted to Islam who are from European populations. And you have individuals, uh, Muslims who are coming from Anatolia, um, not from European populations. So essentially you would expect that some of them would have offspring, right? have children. And so the question is, what does the biology of those children look like? Is it an intermediary between the two? In which case, it makes sense that those children or those individuals might fall somewhere in the middle, not aligning highly with one or the other. This is my strontium isotope analysis. So if you see here these lines, uh, those are the baselines that I defined using the animal bones. Okay, so this is the, it, everything in here is a local signature. So all of these individuals, all these fancy little uh, shapes here, those are individuals who have a strontium signature in the teeth that show that they were very likely consuming and living in the area during their childhood. Okay, so this is an Ottoman garrison in Romania that was inhabited for about 150 years. So we're talking probably second, third generation children of the original soldiers, administrators, uh, and such that came in when this part of Romania was uh, taken up into the Ottoman Empire. Everybody below the line uh, is, has a non-local signature. So their strontium, their teeth signature, doesn't match the local region, indicating they probably had childhood. Their teeth probably developed the enamel somewhere else. Uh, and in both cases, both males and females were, were, were being listed as local and non-local. So we're not talking about a huge influx of male soldiers, right, all coming in at once. It's actually both uh, men and women. So when I put together my, my uh, metric information or my metric data and my strontium data, kind of something interesting showed up. So all of my locals, all of those individuals who fell within the, the, those two baseline lines that show that uh, they were very likely um, raised in this area, in this Ottoman garrison, um, all of them except for one still highly aligned with a very high probability with one of the two comparative groups. Uh, and so essentially this idea if they might have been um, the offspring or a generation of parents who were coming from two different biological um, backgrounds, uh, that they might be listed as other does not hold up. So actually, second and third generation uh, individuals living in the Ottoman garrison were still divergent. They were still highly aligned with either the Europeans or the Anatolians. So what this potentially, 
Uh, I have a paper in right now, we'll see if they agree with me. Uh, this is potentially could be saying is that despite the fact that all of the Muslims living in this garrison, uh, this, ruling, uh, this ruling group, okay, so they actually had, it's a, it's a walled garrison, and they had the Christian community moved out into the suburbs, and so they were living within the walled garrison. This unified political and religious identity, um, despite the fact that they all shared this in common, uh, when, they, when it came to choosing mates or, or choosing people to have children with, uh, they, were con they were staying divided. So perhaps uh, the true-born Muslims, as they called them, the ones um, who were born into the faith, uh, perhaps they were choosing not to um, be with the converts, which they often refer to the European converts, they called renegades, right? So we might have uh, an interesting retention of biological divisions even after um, a couple of decades of living all together. Uh, so some of the conclusions that I came up with, uh, one, it's not a simple population replacement or population conversion, right? So not all of them appear to be uh, European converts, and certainly not all of them appear to be non-Europeans um, migrating in. Uh, second, the Ottomans were a biologically diverse group, right? So uh, even internally, they were very biologically diverse. And third, the biological record can add, I believe, can add significantly to the archaeological and historical record. So uh, that I know of, this is the first project on the European Ottoman history that uses skeletons. Um, this is not a popular time period to analyze historically or archaeologically. Uh, and so I'm hoping to highlight that um, there's actually a lot more work that can be done um, because there's this, this, area of, of the, this area of evidence, this area of data is so undeveloped um, until now. So, in conclusion, I'm going to use my notes for this. Europe has been portrayed uh, for a long time as a Christian political entity, with certain historical time periods and certain peoples, uh, the Romans, the Celts, kind of glorified, uh, and others, such as the Ottomans, kind of demonized. Uh, the Islamic period uh, in this part of the world is at best sometimes ignored, and other times uh, it's treated as a, a blanket period of brutality and force, um, despite the fact that some even historic records and certainly other ev lines of evidence might suggest otherwise. Uh, the, growth of, the growth of Ottoman archaeology and Islamic archaeology, both very understudied as I mentioned, uh, through new research programs can help us reevaluate interpretations of this history. Um, so as with any historical or prehistorical period, anthropology has a, a significant role to play here. Uh, continued research can weaken uh, certain interpre interpretations misused for political and sociopolitical agendas. Uh, so in other words, if everyone believes that the Ottoman period in Hungary was this period of brute invasion by outsiders, it makes it a lot easier for prime, the prime minister to use this invasive story, this narrative, um, to justify his agenda. Right? So continued research can help uh, kind of combat misinterpretations and championing, championing histor certain historical memories and certain historical interpretations over others. Um, so I'm hoping that my research shows that skeletal remains that are already excavated, they're already stored and just an unanalyzed, um, can kind of help with this, with this task. So I want to go back to this map that I showed you in the beginning again. I chose this map for a specific reason. Um, the blue countries here. Uh, these are EU countries and Schengen Zone countries, or free pass countries. Uh, they, are, they belong to the European Union, and in order to cross their borders, you do not need a visa, you do not need to go through checkpoints, you don't need, even need to show your passport. You just freely pass through them. Uh, the green, or excuse me, the pink countries, Romania, Croatia, and Bulgaria, they are in the European Union, but they are not free pass zones, so they have distinct borders and boundaries. Um, up on, on every side of the country. And then the green countries, uh, Bosnia, Serbia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Albania, Turkey, uh, they are neither in the EU nor are they in this free pass or Eurozone using um, the, Euro the European money. Uh, so this is a very small, actually when you look on a world map, this is a very small region of the world uh, and very diverse current political standings. So whether or not you're in the EU, whether or not you have free, uh, free pass on borders has a huge influence on uh, economics, on, on politics, on social, and uh, it truly impacts these people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. I talk with my Romanian colleagues all the time about how they feel about whether or not they should adopt the euro and all the things that that would um, influence them. So this is 
uh, a very real difference between whether or not you're a member in this, um, the massive, all-encompassing European Union. Uh, the differences in this country uh, that still exist today are hugely influenced by this, uh, this history and by the religious and ethnic diversity that came in during this history and by all of the conflict that has happened over the years, um, causing some of them to not be able to kind of get to the economic standing that they need to get into the European Union um, or to be stable enough for the European Union essentially to allow them in. Um, so that is uh, the work that I have done thus far. Um, currently, and just for a second, I'll take a talk about my current uh, directions and perhaps some of the directions I'm thinking about going forward. Uh, I'm currently trying to get the last of my publication. Luckily, I just joined a faculty writing group, um, and so I'm confident I will get there. Um, but I'm trying to get the, the last of my dissertation um, articles published. Uh, and next, I'd like to explore more specific migration and conversion trends. So particularly, this right here, the Ottoman child tribute system kind of fascinates me. So the Ottomans had this uh, large practice of taking child tributes, very uh, Hungarian games-esque, uh, between the ages of 8 to 10. So at 8 to 10, boys were taken from certain populations in Southeast Europe. They were taken to Istanbul. They were trained uh, in the palace schools. And they were raised to be um, actually pretty high-standing members of the government and the military. And so I would like to know if I can find that biologically, whether there's any way I can study that, um, that process. So this summer, before I moved out here from Buffalo, I went and collected some data at Harvard. They have a Bosnian skeletal collection. And Bosnia is one of the populations that all the historic records say the Ottomans uh, really valued for, for these child tributes. For, so they, they took more boys and more tributes from um, this community. Uh, and then uh, I'd like to expand my strontium analysis. I had this great idea a couple weeks ago of a way that I might be able to identify whether or not a couple of the males in my sample were these child tributes um, by comparing strontium signatures at teeth that developed at different times. So teeth that developed before they were eight years old, and then teeth that developed later when they would have likely been in Istanbul training um, for this, this role. Uh, and so I had this kind of aha moment. And then a couple days later, one of my students from archae my archaeology class came in and said, I really want to do some hands-on research. So I'm trying to find a way to do this with her. Uh, and so I'm seeking some foundation funds from the EOU Foundation. Uh, and hopefully, we'll be able to kind of do the small pilot study, and we'll see if it works. Um, and then a long term, I'd like to expand into other countries with an Ottoman heritage. As you saw on that map, there was quite a few other places where this Ottoman heritage is uh, very important. Uh, I'd like to incorporate ethnographic data. So I want to know how the Ottoman history is being taught today. So is this still an overemphasis on these historical narratives of one process over the other in school books? Uh, and then I'd like to share this research in Southeast Europe, particularly in the languages of where I work. Um, some of the articles that I have published are rather hard to read uh, if English is your first language. So I'd really like to share my research in Romanian, Hungarian, and Croatian um, for my colleagues and for uh, the public, the non-archaeological, non-academic public. Uh, and then, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm consulting a bit. Um, I, in certain areas, especially in Romania, if they don't have a bioarchaeological consultant, um, I will consult on a number of different projects. So that's um, always a good time. Uh, and then uh, I'm putting together, just with all of my spare free time, uh, another project in Greenland, just because this sounds like such an exciting and awesome opportunity. And I've got uh, the guys over in uh, Greenland and some specialists over in Copenhagen who specialize in CT scanning mummies. Everybody's on board, so we're hoping to do this uh, in July or August. These are uh, a very famous group of mummies called the Kilikitsok mummies. Um, I know I have pronounced that wrong. The Greenlandic language is very difficult. Um, but they were very famous. They were found back in the 80s. Um, but the women, the females, were not, have not been CT scanned yet. And they, they died at a very important time. They died right before the onset of the Little Ice Age uh, and the period that we see the Norse uh, Vikings disappear. Uh, so we're, we're really hoping to get some kind of energy. I actually have a grant due for this on Wednesday. So um, wish me luck. But other than that, I am happy to take any questions, critiques. Concerns? Nancy. I find all this really fascinating. I love the way that you're using bioarchaeology to 
examine these narratives that people use to situate themselves politically. Um, and I, I find, I just, thanks for doing that. It's really fascinating. Um, I'm interested in how your, what your experience has been as an American in this field. Do you find, um, is there an advantage or disadvantage or is there a set of complex advantages and disadvantages to being an American pursuing this line of inquiry? Oh, great question. Um, I have had a very positive experience. Um, I think that having kind of a neutral stance, right, so I don't have kind of any uh, stock in whether or not it turns out uh, that you know, they're all converted Europeans or their history books are right or whether they're wrong. I don't have a stock in it and so I think maybe the, this neutral stance gives me an advantage. Uh, I don't receive a lot of um, pushback. Uh, in fact, they are very warm and welcoming. They say, absolutely, you want to come and do this research. It's a controversial spot in our history, um, but let's do it. And uh, not only the individuals in Southeast Europe, but actually Turkish cultural ministry representatives were at my museum that I work with in uh, Romania, and they asked me for um, my thoughts on going forward with the research. Uh, they're talking about a repatriation, bringing the skeletons, reburying the skeletons. Um, but they have been very warm towards the idea of me studying them as well. Um, I think uh, because I have, uh, as an American, I'm privileged to have access to some excellent funds for uh, scientific analysis. So my research was funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, you cannot apply for a National Science Foundation grant if you're not an American. Uh, so in, so in certain areas, they're really um, appreciated. They really like to collaborate um, because they have this excellent record and, this, and they're amazing archaeologists, but they don't have the grant money to do like strontium isotope analysis. Uh, so some of the more expensive uh, scientific analyses, uh, they absolutely love collaborating um, or they seem to love collaborating with me. So actually, as an outsider, um, thus far, it's been very positive. Although I tread lightly, because I know that this topic is very real, and um, I at least in Croatia, uh, there are, they are still uncovering the mass graves um, from the, the conflict, so um, I keep that all in mind always. I, I actually have a pretty straightforward question. I just, I don't quite understand how the strontium analysis works. Does it, is it like your, you, your, signature strontium uh, uh, signature whatever you call it is laid down in childhood and then after a certain number of years it just stays the same so that if you spent your childhood in one place like like how do you know that is is there a certain age where it gets set like teenaging or something so that is why we use teeth so human bones remodel You're, they can remodel they change so they can pick up signatures if you move 10 places it can, your bones can pick up signatures from all 10 places your teeth however your dental enamel once, once it forms, it is done. It, it's, once it's complete, your enamel is basically frozen. It's like a capsule of this signature, and your teeth don't remodel ever. That's why if you, you destroy your enamel on your teeth, it doesn't grow back. Um, so once, you're done, once all of the enamel and all of your teeth, have, of your permanent teeth have developed, whatever signature is there is, is essentially encapsulized. It's not going to change. Um, so that's why what it does is it gives us the location of childhood, not necessarily the location of everywhere they've lived in their lifetime. Does that make sense? OK. Uh, I had a question. I was thinking the whole time about the Devsherna, the tribute system. Um, so I think in the Balkans, uh, something I read recently, they, they took these Christian children um, and gave them this incredible education. But they really jumped the numbers up about how many that was. It's, they thought about half a million, and now they're looking more at a million kids. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems that within this, there's something interesting going on. And I just, maybe it's a question for the future, um, that Chris, uh, Muslim families would pose as Christians to get their children good educations. And so you couldn't tell by looking at them, but you would be able to tell so if you saw, if you could somehow find a population of these young men, it would be interesting to see how many are, are Christian or aligned with European cohorts, or how many are Muslims who just want their kid in. Um, so that was, it's a half question and half curiosity. So I think that would be, act that would be rather difficult um, because I can't actually identify the difference in the skeleton between a Muslim and a Christian, right? So if that Muslim was, 
a part of a family lineage that were Europeans, rather they were Quebec. So I can tell biologically that if it was uh, biologically related to a, a, a European population, but if that, if that European population had converted at some point to Muslim, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to, to differentiate that if those were the ones sending their children. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally does. Yeah, so that I can't sense. actually, the only way I can see that is if uh, they are Muslim with the biological descent from outside of Europe, so they're biologically different, not in religion, but in genetic makeup because they come from a different part of the, of the world, if that makes sense. That makes but that sense. is a really interesting uh, point. We, the history tends to create this, this very negative picture of the child tributes, but actually there are cases where um, the history says that people wanted their, their boys to be sent because they had a lot of opportunity. They were, they were put in positions often higher up than um, uh, Ottomans of Turkish descent. So it was actually uh, not always a very negative experience for these, for sure. Yeah. And just a quick follow-up. I know in this time um, a number uh, tens of thousands of Jews ended up in Bulgaria because they were uh, expelled from Spain. And I just wonder if that's come up anywhere or if that's a piece of the puzzle somehow. Yeah, so the, I talk a lot about kind of the Christian background in the, but there is very multi, uh, uh, very, um, how do I say it, very diverse religiously. And actually, uh, much of the historic record says the Ottomans were very tolerant to other uh, other faiths. So um, there are certainly, and in, in Romania, um, we know that some of the individuals living within the garrison were actually were the Jewish community. So they, they kicked out the, the Christians, but they did allow some of the, the Jewish individuals to live in the garrison with them. Uh, so there's, there is definitely this third religion that I'm kind of ignoring here, um, just because it, it was, isn't the dominant one in the parts of Romania and Hungary. But um, that is abs absolutely a, a factor or consideration that I need to think about when I uh, tend to say European Christian, but that's not necessarily the case. It's not, they're not all connected that way, yeah. I just, it's, it's a little more of a comment. It just occurred to me, I was looking, and I don't know if this is a correct analysis or not, but looking at all your data at the beginning and how you had a lot of basically groups that were in the same geographic location but were very, very different, it seems to me that maybe there was just a lot more travel going on in those years than I expect. I, I tend to think of travel as a modern thing, but it, it seems like there were people from all over remaining biologically diverse from each other, um, at even, you know, even quite, you know, during this Ottoman time period. So it's kind of... So one of the, I did have to take that into consideration is I'm not looking at homogeneous populations, right? So let's see if I can get back to the, um, I think it's past here where my skeletal collections are. Um, so I took that into consideration. I'm not looking at people who are, my European populations are not, you know, identical um, biologically, right? So uh, this population in right here is called Zalavar in Hungary. It was actually a mix of um, kind of people of Germanic ancestry, Maiars, um, kind of traditional Hungarian people, um, and some Romans, uh, it's according to the, his, the records that, that says who these people were. So um, some of them, they, they're not homogeneous populations, but that's taken into consideration um, because I'm looking at a group level of, of their, their the, the type of variability. And so whether or not these Ottomans, despite that they're all internally variable still, um, whether or not they kind of align with the range of variability that's going on in there, if, if, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> um, so this is one of the complications is certainly people uh, were not isolated from each other during the medieval period. They were coming in contact with each other. And so I take that into consideration uh, when we analyze them at a group level, um, who it is exactly that I'm looking at when I'm calling them Euro a European population. Were you able to, or did you take into account um, all the Europeans that are sort of mixed in from the Crusades into the Middle Eastern region and the Levant? Yeah, so um, I, I tried to pick populations that I knew the history of, I knew the background of. Um, but again, this, this area is, has certainly had 
um, migration and people coming in and out of them that would mean that there are individuals that have kind of a different signature or a different biological background. Um, that's why we tend to uh, use groups, right? So it kind of, if there's a, a couple of people that are very different, um, it, it doesn't kind of overwhelm the over the entire biological signature that I'm comparing it to. So we always uh, try to, to get at least 30 to 40 individuals to get an idea of, of the diversity, um, taking into account all of these things. And I try to know the historical background. So who, if I can, uh, who were these people? Are they, um, you know, are they essentially people that are known to have a lot of influx from um, some other historical account. So yeah, it's taken into account, but it is one of the complications of, of what I do. Um, so there are statistical ways uh, to make sure essentially that the Europeans that I tested, all of the individuals test in their own category, if that makes sense. So I look and make sure that if, if individual A is analyzed, they still, are, they fall in the same category, they're similar enough uh, to, to match up with the rest of, their, of the population. Um, so I look at that to see if, there, if there's any outliers, essentially, any people who are very different biologically. So. I, I, I was really interested in your, uh, what, one of the aspects of your future project, and perhaps it ties in to what Nancy really liked about it, was the narratives and the idea of um, looking at the education uh, of students in this area. And I want to push you a little bit and say, what, what might that look like? Like, wh what, first of all, you know, four fields, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> you're very brave to kind of. In, in oh, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to partner with a, <laughs> a <laughs> with cultural or yes, yeah. a cultural anthropologist or somebody who, yeah, no, I, that's a little, I mean, I could start preliminary, but I, in, in my ideal project, if I have the funding, I partner with somebody who specializes in this for sure. Yeah, do you have any thoughts about kind of what that looks like? Are you just looking at curriculum, or are you going to be looking at hidden curriculum type aspects of the education environment? And I'd like to know not only curriculum, because I think curriculum is really important, but I also think um, family stories and how it's talked about at home is really important, because that's where um, it, when, I, when I talk to my uh, ac academic colleagues out there, they, they also have opinions. They, they'll say kind of in passing, oh yeah, all the Ottomans were converted Europeans, they were all forced to, you know, I, I've heard some of them or some of the people I've interacted with already say that. Um, and so I, I think not just the textbooks, but I'd also like to know where these narratives are started. Are they started at home? Um, are they started in certain communities over other communities, uh, especially in areas that um, are still trying to recover from the, um, some of the conflict that has stemmed from it. So no, it would, uh, I'd like, I want to start with curriculum, but I actually think kind of a more grassroots approach to understanding how, what people understand about this period and what their opinion is outside of the schools um, is potentially even more illuminated, illuminating. Thank you. Do you have other? Um, I had a question about the tribute system. Um, yes. What biological evidence would actually suggest that somebody was involved with that? So I would, what, I, what I'm hoping to do is, uh, A, see if they are males uh, who align highly with the population. So this is an, as an indirect way of looking at this question, right? So I can't actually prove just because they, they align highly with the Bosnians and they're male. It's not, it doesn't mean for sure that they are, but if I'm seeing in a population all of the males are aligning highly with this chosen population and they're all males and perhaps even looking at pathology, do they have signs that they were, uh, they served in the military, do they have um, evidence, you know, on the body of this kind of thing. Um, it's a, it would be a kind of an indirect way of exploring the question without being able to prove it. And then in the strontium, um, because I've, test, I've tested teeth that were developed young, and then I also um, have third molars, which develop at the age in which they would have, if they were tributes, they would have been in Istanbul. And so if I, if I take males, uh, the male individuals, and if I can see that the, the strontium signature um, mismatches between these two, and potentially, it, it, you can't really prove for sure that they came from um, an area just because they're within, the, within uh, that range, but it might be also an indirect way of saying, uh, 
he's a male, he's got these signatures of two different locations. The locations are relatively close to the signatures first in the, the Bosnian or the population that's ideal for tributes and then where the tributes were sent to. I'm hoping maybe it'll have some interesting, yeah, it might be an interesting thing to do. I won't be able to prove it though. Not with 100%. Maybe even look at how they were buried, if they were buried separately from everybody else or anything like that. So. Do we have any other questions for Keith? Oh. <laughs> I didn't want to ask if I wasn't bringing something different. Um, your, your work is premised that on the idea that the uh, Ottoman administrators are genetically distinct from the local folks. And you've done, you've looked at some comparator um, uh, graves or skeletal sources to try to bolster that. I don't be value laden about it. But uh, it does strike me that these regions have been part of the same political units over a very long period of time. Portions of them part of the Hellenistic Empire, certainly Roman Empire, Roman Empire in the East. Um, so as part of the thought, and, and I'm going to say maybe, I just don't know, but is that um, when the Byzantine Empire fell, that there would be a significant replacement, sort of genetic replacement of people who were administrators and leadership people from a different sort of ethnic group that had done that when they were all speaking Greek. Uh, and that would then mean that when these same sort of functions were now being performed later on by the Ottoman Empire, it would be a a truly different group of people genetically from what it would have been before uh, or who might have already been there. So I think, are you getting at whether or not there is this actual distinct biological differences that yes. I'm, I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, so to be honest with you, I didn't actually think this was going to work. When uh, I set up this project, because I thought the same thing, I thought these people live too close to each other, there's too much common history, um, it's probably not going to work. So I actually did a pilot study fully expecting it to fail. Um, and so I was surprised that it's still, there was enough difference, right? Now if we take them, uh, these communities, and we compare them on a global scale, they're going to mesh very close to, to each other, certainly. Um, but when I got down to a local scale, there was still enough difference that statistically I was able to highly, highly align some of these individuals with one or the other. I agree with you, I thought actually it wasn't going to work. I thought they were going to be too similar. Um, over time, it seems that uh, these studies have kind of shown that if you, people who live close to each other, even with migrations and even with other um, sources, of, they, still, they still can re they retain kind of a biological signature um, that can be used uh, in these studies. But it's an excellent point, and it's a point that I thought myself. Um, I was relieved it worked. National Science Foundation might not have been amused <laughs> if it didn't. <laughs> um, I have a question. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your thoughts. You mentioned taking students in some sort of opportunity and field work. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about what you envisioned with that, how you would incorporate students into your research down the road. Uh, well, a couple ways. So a couple of things I've just imagined in my head. One of them would be, uh, there's this, there was a skeletal collection in Sesgard, Hungary. Uh, it's uh, this rural, uh, very small town in Hungary. It's beautiful. It's in perfect condition. Uh, it was excavated perfectly. There's all of these uh, children. Uh, there's all, it's a very large collection and uh, other than my work, almost nothing has been done. Uh, so one way I vision is kind of a, a small field, uh, field study in which a kind of upper level students who've maybe taken a class in bioarchaeology, they can pick something that they want to collect. Maybe they want to look at signs of disease or they want to look at just the children remains and, and determine the age of the children uh, that, and who, were, who were obviously deceased. So why were they dying at a certain age? Uh, and they would each pick kind of a small thing to collect data from and then we would go and I would kind of help them collect this piece of data uh, and then we would almost build like this narrative or this uh, you know, background to the skeletal collection um, with, you know, all these different little parts uh, allowing them to do, and then they could come back and actually present their original research at a conference, which is always ideal as an undergrad if you can do that. Uh, and then in Croatia, uh, as I was leaving, I was uh, in Croatia in the winter. Um, I didn't get a chance to do very much sightseeing. I was very pregnant, uh, and so when I wasn't collecting data, I was sleeping. 
Uh, and, but as I was leaving, my uh, collaborator said, you have to come back when you're not pregnant and you have more time. Uh, and we'll, we'll set up, a, you want an excavation? We'll set up an excavation right on the Dalmatian coast. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna take you up on that someday. So another idea would be to do an actual field excavation um, in Croatia and collaborate with my Croatian colleagues there because I love working with them. Um, and then in Romania, uh, the, I lo absolutely love Romania. It's one of my favorite places to be in the whole world. Um, so any kind of project, I would love to do kind of a tour of historic Romania through Transylvania, uh, maybe you know, stop at the museums that I work in and, and do some research, or just do kind of a, um, a historical background of, of Romania through uh, with some of my colleagues who specialize in history and language and literature and maybe do kind of different stops along the way and they get a chance to interact with some of the, the people that I've interacted with and collaborated with over there. So those are my fantasy ideas that I've, I've thought about, but we'll see. <laughs> Are there any other questions? If not, we might go ahead and um, if people want to talk with Katie afterwards, she has a few minutes to sit and chat with us. Otherwise, thank you all for coming in. Um, have a great thank evening. You.